o'clock news. The Bay Area's most complete nighttime television report with the award-winning Channel 2 news team and late satellite coverage from around the world. Good evening, I'm Claude Mann. And I'm Elaine Corral. Britain and Argentina are at war tonight, and observers say a land invasion of the Falkland Islands by British Marines now appears imminent. The outbreak of a full-fledged war in the windswept South Atlantic came shortly before dawn this morning as waves of British bombers screaming in at low levels attacked the two airstrips on the island, including the critical air base at Port Stanley, the only lifeline to the 9,000 Argentine troops occupying the disputed island. Mark Phillips has more on the story. The British have not released pictures of the actual raid, but they have said Vulcan bombers like these made up the first wave. They took off from Ascension Island, about 4,000 kilometers away, and flew non-stop to the Falklands, refueling en route. The Vulcans have recently been converted from their nuclear bomber role to carry conventional weapons. They arrived at about 4.40 this morning Falklands time, likely working from high altitudes, and leaving about 30 craters on the runways at the Port Stanley and Goose Green airfields. The Harriers, seen here practicing bombing runs as the fleet headed south, arrived at the Falklands at 8.20 in the morning. The British say they hit the airfields and planes on the ground. Throughout the day in London, the British Defense Ministry had been supplying sketchy information on the raids and refuting Argentine claims that there had been British casualties. All aircraft and personnel involved have now returned. There are no casualties. The British said the raids were successful, that runways and aircraft were hit. They also challenged the statements from Buenos Aires that there had been an Argentine counterattack. And now I wonder if I could refer to statements that I've seen on various tapes that Argentine planes have launched offensive operations against British ships. I think I can only say we have no reports of such an engagement. The information on the raids came as Francis Pym was leaving for Washington and New York to pursue whatever diplomatic options may be left. In Britain, the raids are seen as strengthening his hand and demonstrating once again that if the diplomacy fails completely, the military threat is real. There was no proof offered in London today to support the British version of events, but in making their announcement today, British Defense Department spokesmen were at pains to point out that they were taking their time to collect all the evidence in the interest of accuracy. The British are counting on the world believing their story as they relentlessly increase the military pressure in the step-by-step -step way that's been the strategy from the beginning. Mark Phillips, CBC News, London. Argentina still claims it downed at least two, possibly four, of the British jets, killing one pilot, capturing another, and the British still deny any losses. They have, however, confirmed that Argentine jets did attack the British fleet, hitting at least one frigate, but they say it was not seriously damaged. And Argentina tonight confirmed that two of their attacking planes were downed and another damaged in that attack. For the latest on the war between Britain and Argentina, we have Jerry Smith on the phone. She's a reporter for United Press International. She is in Buenos Aires, where it is now 2 in the morning. Hello, Jerry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you tell us what the situation is right now? The situation now is uh, it's still very active here tonight. It's 2 in the morning, but there are still government communiques coming out claiming that the British did make five attacks on the island and that the Argentines did manage to shoot down five British planes and cripple at least one ship. It's hard to know which side to believe, but the Argentines are, are quite firm in their belief that they did down these planes and cripple that ship. Can, can you speculate at all? Because that seems to be the big story today, where Britain says one thing, Argentina says the other, um, one side claims casualties, the other not. Can, can you speculate at all what, what your point of view is? What do you it, think it's very is? difficult to say because even though we are down here in Buenos Aires, we are still uh, almost 500 miles away from the islands and no one is allowed near. Uh, but Argentines themselves are very convinced that, especially in the United States, which has decided to support Great Britain, the news is being quite biased toward, our, toward uh, Great Britain and that uh, they are very likely to believe the British version rather than the Argentine version. And I think that's why the Argentines have been so careful to, to make all these statements in the in the Argentine embassy in Washington to make sure that the news of what they believe is happening 
gets to the United States. Uh, one quick question, Jerry. The, the uh, Britons, if they do land on the island, is there any speculation on what Argentina will do? Uh, excuse me, I couldn't hear you. If Britain does land on the island, is there any speculation what Argentina will do? Uh, the Argentines really do not believe that the British will ever set foot on the islands because they believe that now they've taken them, they just are not, they're going to defend them until the end, and even if it means a lot of death. Um, however, if they do land on the island, um, I think the Argentines feel that they are more prepared to fight than incoming forces who have been on aircraft carriers and possibly seasick for a week would be. I thank you very much, Jerry. Bye-bye. That was Jerry Smith. She's a reporter for UPI in Buenos Aires. Argentine President Leopoldo Galtieri denounced the British attack as a violation of United Nations policy, and he ordered Foreign Minister Costa Mendez to return to New York to denounce the attack at the UN. Costa Mendez had arrived in Buenos Aires this morning, shortly after the British raid. He said there would be a double response, diplomatic and military. Costa Mendez also lashed out at the U.S., saying he was surprised by the Reagan administration's decision to back Britain. He said the decision will impair U.S. policy in Latin America for years to come. In Buenos Aires, there were reports of new anti-American feelings and threats. Several U.S. executives doing business there say they've tightened securities. Other companies are reportedly getting ready to evacuate their American employees from Argentina. In Washington, the Falklands crisis was left largely in the hands of Secretary of State Alexander Haig. President Reagan headed for Tennessee to open the 1982 World's Fair. Dave Browdy has more on the story. They didn't wake the president to tell him of the British attack, and when he met with reporters before leaving for Tennessee, President Reagan thought the Argentine foreign minister was still in New York. The British attacks and the departure of Foreign Minister Costa Mendez for Buenos Aires came as a surprise, said the president, who even in Tennessee insisted a peaceful settlement is still possible. There have been no casualties and we're still hoping for a peaceful settlement. Officially opening the 1982 World's Fair in Knoxville, the president once again attacked congressional Democrats on the budget. He also remarked on the fair's theme, energy turns the world. The president said decontrol is the ultimate solution to America's energy problems. The president had very little to say about the Falcons. He did tell reporters he believes the fighting will not mean all-out war. Shortly after the British attack this morning, uh, Japan announced economic sanctions against Argentina, but there was also support for Argentina, as the British flag was burned by demonstrators in Venezuela. Thousands of protesters chanted anti-British slogans in Spain. And the government there branded the British offensive as an historic error. So far, Spain is the only Western European nation to condemn the British attack. But Germany's Chancellor Helmut Schmidt reportedly considers the move to be a very serious mistake. Officially, the German government has called for a renewed effort to end the hostilities. Still to come on the 10 o'clock news, a worker at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory comes down with Legionnaire's disease and other workers there are warned to be on the alert for symptoms. And a spectacular volcanic eruption on the island of Hawaii, red-hot lava is flowing down the mountainside. Thirty people are homeless tonight in San Francisco as a result of a four-alarm fire. Fire gutted a three-story building in the Fillmore District early this morning. Businesses on the ground floor were badly damaged, as were apartments on the upper floors. No one was killed, but there was only one serious injury reported, and for some residents, it was a very close call. The smoke was streaming up from the fire escape, and I grabbed my baby and, and stuck him up under my blouse. And I made it down the fire escape, and I had to catch him by one arm and walk down the fire escape and stand out in the backyard until the fireman broke down the fence to come get me and my baby out. I done lost all my clothes, all everything, including my Social Security money that I got yesterday, everything. The fire caused more than $400,000 damage. Chief Andrew Casper said the cause is not known, but he suspects faulty wiring. And 18 people in West Oakland were left homeless early this morning when three houses caught on fire on Campbell Street and another house went up in flames on 13th Avenue. The first three-alarm blaze broke out at 1229 Campbell Street late last night and quickly spread to two neighboring houses. 
all three homes were occupied at the time. Residents were forced to flee the burning homes and their night clothes. One house was totally destroyed. The two others sustained heavy damage. The cause of this blaze is still under investigation. Then several hours later, another three alarm blaze broke out. This one at 1504 13th Avenue in Oakland. The residents there were forced to jump from a second story window to escape. A spokesman said the origin of that blaze is suspicious and arson is suspected. An employee of the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory is hospitalized tonight with what doctors say they believe is Legionnaire's disease. Precisely where 55-year-old Victor Karpenko caught that disease is now unclear. It may have been at the lab. John Fowler reports. Karpenko worked in a year-old office building at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. The disease-causing bacteria are thought to have concentrated in a rooftop air conditioner and may have been carried in air ducts through the building. This Friday we had a meeting of approximately 300 people in the building and we asked employees if they could do come down with a high fever or any of the other symptoms um, like those in Legionnaire's disease, that they contact their physician and explain to them there is a possibility of Legionella pneumophila and um, take those precautions their physician recommends and then call the lab and inform us if there's that contact. Have you had any reports? None at all, no. I think most people realize that it's a disease that can be contracted by anybody in, in many circumstances, and we have not seen an epidemic, so there's not a lot of concern right now. Because of the incident Friday, the air conditioning system has now been sterilized, its exhaust redirected away from the building. A water sample is now being tested at a laboratory in Alabama specializing in Legionnaire's disease. Test results are expected within a week. The Legionella pneumophila, the bacteria that causes the disease, is present in air conditioning systems, evaporative coolers, shower heads, um, faucets, lakes and streams, and we do have an evaporative cooler here. Legionnaire's disease has only been identified in the last six years, although the bacteria that causes it is known to occur naturally almost everywhere in the environment. What isn't known is why some people are resistant to the disease, while others die from it. I'm John Fowler in Livermore for the 10 o'clock news. Still to come tonight, Soviet President Leonid Brezhnev makes a rare public appearance for May Day. And here in Berkeley, May Day is spent putting down the American president. It was anti-Reagan Day on the Cal campus. It was, that wasn't a picture, but we'll have that coming up. But first, Mark Ibanez is here to tell us all about yeah. sports. Great race today. The 108th running of the Derby produces one of the more memorable winners. Long shot that came from dead last at the first turn to win it. We'll have a look at that and, of course, plenty of baseball in this season of streaks. The Giants and A's are working on a pretty good couple of them themselves, and we'll show you what that's all about right after this. Another astounding victory by a long shot. This time it's Gapto del Sol, a 21-to-1 shot winning the most well-known event in all of horse racing, the Kentucky Derby. Out of the 19th post, Gatto Del Sol, who finished fourth in the Santa Anita Derby, strode into the lead at the top of the stretch. Here's the call as jockey Eddie De La House whipped Air in the shape. The Air Forbes one has the head in front. Gatto Del Sol on the outside with reinvested. Muttering now moves up between horses. El Baba down on the inside. In the final furlong, Gatto Del Sol is in front. Reinvested is second on the outside. That's Laser Light. Here we are. Gatto Del Sol with the lead. Under the war, Gatto Del Sol wins it by two and a half. His trainer says he won't run in the Preakness, so Gatto Del Sol had his moment in the sun today, though winning in 202, 2 and 5 over the mile and a quarter. Well off Secretariat's record. The payoff, 44.40, $19.940. Laser Light didn't have enough. Second place money was 17 and 920. Reinvested showed for 440. Favorite Air Forbes 1 was back in seventh place. Castellaria, the one eyed claustrophobic horse, finished 13th in this 19 horse field. Baseball. The A's appear to have ironed out their early season problems. They flattened Cleveland again, 8-2. to two. Four of the last five have now gone into the W column for Oakland. Wayne Gross has waited quite a while for that first round tripper of the year. 
comes today, one of his three hits that helped put the A's on their way. Wayne also had a pair of RBIs. In the three-run sixth inning, Mike Heath hits a towering drive to left. He misses a home run by a thumbnail. Jim Sexton, though, will come around to score. Heath settles for three bases, a ribby, and a dirty uniform. 25 runs in three games now for Oakland. Tom Underwood saved Jeff Jones's win. Gross adds insurance with an RBI single off Ed Whitson. The Giants are also clicking. Clicking. They won their battle of the unknown pitcher again. 6-3 over the Mets for their fourth straight triumph. After spotting the Mets a couple early runs, the wheels of Daryl Evans helped get one back. Jeff Ranson, a bouncer to third, and Daryl can always talk about the time he flat out ran Hubie Brooks to the plate and scores for a 2-1 to one trailing. Giants had it tied, though, at two, and then pulled the double steal. Chili Day was thrown out trying to steal second, but Johnny Lamaster swipes the plate with a slide. Jeff Ransom doing a nice job filling in for the injured Milt May. Singles to center. Last night's hero, Reggie Smith, around from third, beating the throw. And then Dwayne Kuyper a little later, pinch hitting for the pitcher. Atley Hamaker singles through the right side. Two more runs across. Five of six now for the Giants with relief help from Jim Barr and Greg Mitten. Atley Hamaker and his starting debut as a Giant has a win. Hamaker, of course, was acquired in that Vita Blue trade. San Francisco couldn't pick up ground on the Dodgers, who had late inning heroics from Jorge Orta. A man on and two out in the eighth. The pinch hitter strokes a goner to right center for a 2-1 Dodger lead. Expos threaten in the ninth inning. The defensive man of the hour, Dusty Baker. He will gun down Warren Cromarty, who tried to score from second on Tim Wallach's single. No can do. A 2-1 Dodger win is preserved. Looked a little like the big red machine of old at Riverfront since he 2-1, 10-1 over the cards. Danny Dreesen cranked it up in the seventh with the bases loaded. His first ever grand slam, it locked it up. Mario Soto, who helped himself with a couple of hits, went the distance for the win. Also had uh, two hits and almost went to distance in the ring. After a brush back, he went after Mark Mattel. Things stopped well short of a brawl, however, although Gene Tennis was ejected. Touring the rest of the big leagues, the Cubs clubbed Atlanta 5-1. San Diego 9-6 over Philly. Cruz and Poole homer to Nolan Ryan's second win of the year. Over in the American League, Detroit defeated the White Sox 5-2. Don Baylor's two-run 13th inning homer beat the Birds. Gorman Thomas's home run ignited a five-run eighth for the Brewers. 8-7, Kansas City over Toronto. Boston took 12 innings to hand Texas their eighth consecutive loss. Roy Smalley, a grand slam in the Yankees' win. Saturday afternoon matinee, NBA playoff style in Milwaukee. We had the clash of the Titans, game three of the Bucks Sixers series. Bob Lanier and Daryl Dawkins go at it, wrestling for position. Very physical game. Milwaukee by 11. They had the muscle from Mickey Johnson. Sixers survive the quickness of Clint Richardson, though. A body extension steal and a slam reward at the other end. They were within four, a knuckle biter until the conclusion. 140 left. Caldwell Jones pops from outside. Philly was with one. Two, Mo Cheeks free throws had the Sixers up by five with five, two, one by five seconds left. Milwaukee ball, watch Sidney Moncrief take a pass, drive right of the lane, put up a wild shot in off the glass at the buzzer. Moncrief shot has the Bucks back in it. They still trail 2-1 to one in Landover, Maryland. The Celts take a 2-1 lead over Washington in their series, 92-83. Boston was led by Robert Parrish. He had 25 points. Vancouver and the Islanders both won their NHL playoff games. Cal beat Stanford in their track meet. That's the sporting line. Thank Saturday. you very much. I guess you're dying to hear what the weather was. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Got it right now. It was windy and a little cloudy around the Bay Area today. The kind of weather that reminds us summer is still a ways off yet. The temperatures hovered mostly in the upper 50s and low 60s, with only Kenfield getting as high as 69 degrees. San Francisco was the coolest place to be today. The high was only 55 degrees there. The forecast calls for low clouds along the coast tomorrow morning, becoming partly cloudy in the afternoon with temperatures much like today in the upper 50s along the coast to maybe, that's maybe, the low 70s inland with westerly winds 15 to 25 miles per hour. But for the rest of tonight, there's low clouds and fog around the bay with a chance of a drizzle. So, Claude, you have to be careful driving home tonight. Well, that forecast sounds all right to me. We'll be back with uh, more news in a minute, and you'll finally get a chance to see those rather spectacular pictures of the volcano Kilauea. A bubbling pool of lava could still be seen in the crater of Hawaii's Kilauea volcano today, some 24 hours after a spectacular eruption. Thousands of people flocked to the scene to watch. We have more on the story from Candy Fleece. The eruption started here at the summit. Just after 11.30 this morning, the floor of Kilauea caldera split. Steam escaped, then within three minutes, a curtain of fire spewed some 30 feet in the air. There used to be a trail here. In fact, you could walk all the way across the floor of Kilauea Crater. 
Two people were on that trail this morning when the volcano erupted. They were brought to safety by park rangers. And since then, more than 50 feet of lava has accumulated. The lava fountains extend some three quarters of a mile along the fissure and into Hale Mau Mau, a sort of sub-crater within the caldera, and as legend has it, the traditional home of Madame Pele, the goddess of fire. There have been some rock slides along the rim of Hale Mau Mau, which scientists say is normal. Scientists say the eruption hasn't stabilized yet, but they do not believe the fountains will blow higher or extend beyond this crater. Where are you from? Colorado. You were just visiting? Just Yeah, we were down, staying down in Kona and just came up for this evening. I missed my flight tonight. I'm going back tomorrow. <laughs> what do you think of it? I think it's magnificent. <laughs> do you believe in Madame Pele? I don't know. I kind of... He did pick flowers. <laughs> yeah, I've been picking flowers, that's for sure. Candy Fleece, Channel 2 News at Kilauea Crater on the Big Island. Defying Poland's martial law regime, 50,000 people took to the streets in Warsaw today, shouting, Long Live Solidarity! They tore down Communist Party banners while heavily armed police watched in grim silence. Official May Day celebrations were overshadowed by that protest. Sources say a similar protest took place in Gdansk, the birthplace of Solidarity, the union that was outlawed nearly five months ago. The May Day celebration in Moscow went much more smoothly as workers paraded through Red Square under the watchful eyes of Soviet President Leonid Brezhnev. A 75-year-old Soviet leader appeared frail and weary. He sat down several times during that 90-minute parade. The mayor of Berkeley, Gus Newport, officially proclaimed this day as anti-Reagan Day and sponsored a festival in Berkeley's Provo Park to celebrate the occasion. The demonstration was called BARF Day, which stands for Berkeley Against Reagan Festival. About a thousand people showed up, some dressed as the president and first lady, others threw darts at balloons, which apparently represented Reagan's program. Still others knocked down cans that stood for the Reagan cabinet. The atmosphere is very low key, though. A lot of music, singing and dancing. Uh, they appear to come up as much like a picnic as a political statement. And that is the news on this May Day, 1982. Thank you very much for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow night. Hope you will be too. Good night. Good night.